Good morning, everybody. Is that up and running? Good morning. Ah, working now, excellent. If we could take our seats, please. Well, I, I, I bet you can't guess what Sunday it is. Uh, and it's really, really appropriate on Bible Sunday that we've got um, Tim and Maggie uh, gathered here, and we're going to be hearing from them a little bit later. It's lovely to see them. They were saying earlier on, because last time they were here was pre-pandemic. Back in, those, back in those days. Um, but um, it's fantastic to have, have you back. Just going to start uh, with a prayer and then just a couple of quick notices before we move on so that I don't forget to do them. Let's start with a prayer. Father, thank you for this Bible Sunday. Thank you for this day where we look at your word and look at how important that is to us as Christians and how important it is that we know that you are with us and that you have spoken to us through those words. So please bless us now as we listen to those words and spend some time with you here today. Amen. So a couple of very quick notices. Firstly, next week uh, we won't be here because it's our fifth Sunday United Benefits Service. So the service will be at 10 o'clock at um, St. Anne and St. Lawrence in Elmstead. There is, after the service, a lunch. If you are interested in staying for that lunch, um, there is a sign-up sheet at the back. If you could please uh, sign up today, that would be really, really helpful, and we can get the information to them. So um, that's the service at 10 o'clock at Elmstead. There will not be a service here at 11. Um, yeah, if, if anyone needs, anyone need a lift? That looks nice and simple then. Uh, now, the second thing is, uh, Andrew asked me to put that in the notice sheet, um, and then it didn't, occur, it didn't occur to me, I just put it in, it didn't occur to me that it wasn't obvious what it was about, uh, because it says St Andrew's Church, but it's not this St Andrew's Church. That's the confusing bit. Uh, it's St Andrew's Church in Wheelie, which is the church that we have been supporting um, while they have no minister. Um, so it's St Andrew's Church in, in Wheelie have got a, um, a, a, a concert step into, stepping into Christmas in December. So it's not this St Andrew's Church, it's St Andrew's Church in Wheelie. I probably should have put that on there. I will add that for next week. Okay, excellent. Next slide, please. So uh, as we've already said, it is Bible Sunday... And I thought this, um, this very short reading out of Romans 15 is a really, really important to our understanding of what the Bible means. Everything written in the scriptures was written to teach us in order that we might have hope through the patience and encouragement which the scriptures give us. The scriptures were written thousands of years ago, but that does not mean they're not relevant. They're incredibly relevant to us. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. So, as often happens when I'm standing here leading, I am now going to walk about two metres in that direction, and we're going to have our first song. So if you're able, please stand, and we're going to sing to God be the Lord. To God be the glory, great things He had done, so mighty the love that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and
Please be seated. And as we do every Sunday, we come and we recognise that we don't get it right all the time and we do need to say sorry to God. So we're going to say sorry to God now and, and think of the things that we've not got right in our lives because we know that God will forgive us. So let's say these words together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, in a moment, um, Tim's going to come and talk to us about what they've been up to over the last three years uh, since, we had, since we, we've been with them. But we're going to start, before we do that, we're just going to have a quick prayer uh, for Bible Sunday. Let's say this together. Your word is the light we see, a guide for our footsteps to where you are found. Your word is the strength we find when darkness threatens to overwhelm. Your word is the power we need to become servants of a heavenly king. Your word is the reason we live in the sure knowledge you are everything. Amen. Tim. There's another Tim at my church as well, and I get very confused, and they say, Tim's going to pray, and it's not me. <laughs> so, we are Tim and Maggie David, oops, I've got the clicker, and we work for Wycliffe Bible Translators. Um, my connection with St. Andrews goes back, way back to 1983, which is when I first came here as a student, so that's 39 years ago, that's, so, and then when I graduated, I lived in the village for a little while and was involved with the music group and with various other things. Um, St Andrews has been supporting Maggie and I uh, since 1995, which is when we left our jobs with BT to work for Wycliffe Bible Translators. For a while, we lived in Senegal in West Africa uh, for 12 years. Uh, currently, we're based in Ipswich, and we make trips to and from Africa. Now, as... A, Nick said it's been three years since we were here. I can't possibly fill you in with all we've been up to in the past three years. I'll just give you a few highlights to give you an idea of what we're doing, particularly some of our most recent trips. But before I do that, I just want to talk about the availability of Scripture. Now, I don't expect you to actually be able to see the little writing there. I'm going to blow some of that up in a minute. But just the, the picture, the top blobs are, the, are languages, and the bottom blobs are actual people represent people. So the first column is the full Bible. So you can see that a small number of languages, but a lot of people have the full Bible. And then it's the New Testament, and then selection and stories, and no known scripture. So let's just zoom in a bit. So the full Bible. So that's 717 languages, uh, only 717 languages out of about 3,500 languages have the full Bible. That still does represent 5.75 billion people. For the New Testament, so that's another 1,582 languages, which is 830 million people. So those 830 million people, they know about, they can read about the things Jesus did and the disciples, but they they can't read about the creation, about Moses and Exodus, and the kings. They probably don't have Psalms, so there's a lot they don't have. And then there's a further 1,196 languages, which just has selections and stories. Maybe they have a gospel, maybe they have, maybe they do just have Genesis, just one book of the Bible, a few books of the Bible. Um, that's another 830 million people. And then that leaves 
3,802 languages with no known scripture, uh, which is 220 million people. So that's quite a lot of people. Now, this is the remaining translation needs. Now, the, the total there doesn't quite match the number of languages without scripture, um, because there are some languages which unfortunately are dying, they're just on their last few people. Um, there are some languages where everyone in the, in the language group is completely bilingual and speaks very well another language. But still, there's 1,892 translation needs still around the world, which is 145 million people still need some translation, maybe the Old Testament, maybe the rest of the New Testament. And as you can see, the main places where there are still needs are uh, Africa, with 500 and Asia with 751. So, as I said, we used to live in Africa. We now live in Ipswich, and we make regular trips to Africa. My responsibility uh, is uh, I, my responsibility is to do with French West. Well, as we say French-speaking West Africa. So that, that's a unit in our organization, which covers the countries of Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Côte d'Ivoire. So we're members of Wycliffe Bible Translators, but we, when we're in Africa, we work with our main partner organization, which is known as SIL. Most of my work is in, uh, with the languages of Côte d'Ivoire, otherwise known as, in English as Ivory Coast. My main contribution to the Bible translation effort is connected with linguistics, so the study of languages. It's a foundation for translation. Translators can't be good translators unless they have a really good understanding of their own languages and also of how languages in general work. So earlier on this year, I was in Ivory Coast for three weeks and I was uh, teaching a two-week course to a group of translators on uh, grammar. So this is not you know, English grammar, it's not French grammar, it's the grammar of their languages. So we try and explain to them the sort of structures they might find. We encourage them to look at their languages and to help them understand better their languages. So that when it comes to translating and they see something uh, in French or English, then they will know well how to what structures to use in their own language. I've just come back from another trip to Ivory Coast. Most of my trips, all my trips to Ivory Coast so far have been to Abidjan, which is one of the biggest cities in Ivory Coast. This time I was actually able to make a trip out to a small town called Sassandra. Um, as you can maybe see from that, it's not a particularly well-developed town, but that's the place where the NEO translation team are working, and I went to visit them. Here's a picture of me and my colleague Jack with two other translators. Um, so the, the lady on the right, she's also a, um, the director of a a non-governmental organization, a small organization that she herself set up with 25 other people um, to deal with health in, uh, and women. But she, has, uh, she is giving up some of her time to translate the Bible into her own language. And she's working with uh, the other lady there as well, and a, and a man. I was there because I'd been helping them in a previous trip to uh, work out the best way of writing their language. Um, but I was there to sort of follow up some of the, the work that we'd been doing with them. While we were there, they have recently translated Mark, the Gospel of Mark, and printed that. So there's a lot of enthusiasm at the moment within that language group to buy this. And while we were there, we visited Evelyn, the ladies' village, which is right on the beach, as you can see. And as we were walking along, we met the chief of the village. So Evelyn, she was very good. She had a, a, a copy of Mark in her uh, handbag or whatever, so she whipped it out and said, Mr. Chief, well, here's Mark. And he was very enthusiastic to have it. And in fact, here, 
she's actually transferring the audio recording from one phone to another. So mobile phones are everywhere in Africa, so, and there's a, lo a lot more people that can hear, uh, listen, than can read. So often we trans translate things and then have audio recordings. So that's my work. I'm in French-speaking West Africa. Maggie is sort of like works at the next level up of the organization. She works in French-speaking Africa, which is a vast area. So she travels a lot more than I do. But she was also, at the beginning of the year, also in Ivory Coast. So Maggie has several hats. One of her hats is uh, building capacity in project management. Because translation isn't just the translators sitting in their office doing the translation. There's a whole host of other supporting work that needs to be done, and particularly uh, project management is a, an important thing. And Maggie was there because the, the lady on the right, uh, she was just retiring, and the lady on the far left was just taking over her role along with the assistance of the man on the right. So Maggie was there to speak to them, to try and help them, uh, to try and build up their ability to manage projects. In our area, the French-speaking Africa area, there are a lot of language programs managers, as we call them, who are Africans, fairly young, um, who are inexperienced. And Maggie is able to come alongside them and mentor them and lead them and help them do their jobs better. So Maggie, you know, as I say, she travels to a lot of these countries. Uh, she was also in Cameroon more recently. And there she was, with another one of her hat on, hats on, she was there for the leadership team meetings of French-speaking Africa. Um, that's, one of, that's a picture of her and the team. This man at the front on the left, David, he is the director for French-speaking West Africa, French-speaking Africa, Marla. And that leadership team meeting uh, was then followed up by this meeting of uh, where she was working with country leaders across French-speaking Africa. Um, they were meeting together to discuss ongoing issues, to pray with each other, to encourage one another, um, to, to support one another. And there's a picture of them all together. Um, on another subject, you may remember, those of you who have been following us, that for a number of years I was doing a PhD to enable me to do my job better. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, I was finally award, um, awarded it virtually. I, I had a virtual interview thing instead of the official thing in Leiden. And then finally, this August, two years later, I was finally able to go there and pick up my certificate. So that's what that uh, is happening there. That's my supervisor sort of handing it to me. I thought we needed an official photo. So I have finished studying. Now Maggie is now doing some study. So Maggie is now doing an MA in missiology, the study of mission. But the, the main things that she's doing this uh, MA for are these two modules, which are called transformational development and mission strategy. Um, if you want to know more about what those actually are, you need to ask Maggie. So Maggie, Maggie's doing this part-time and online, mostly. So this is just another thing that she, has to fit, she fits in with all the work that she's doing. So that just gives you a taste of what we've been up to. So we do have a lot of trips between us. So we value your ongoing prayer for all our work, particularly the travel, which is not always necessarily um, smooth. We, yeah, we thank you for your ongoing support. For, you know, it's, we can't do what we're doing now without your support in prayer and in other ways. For those of you who haven't uh, seen us before and are interested to know more, we do have a, a regular prayer letter, newsletter that we send out. If you want to know more about us and want to sign up for that, we have a few leaflets there at the back or you can just come and see us afterwards. So, thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Tim. Or, or do we have to call you Dr. Tim? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tim, if you like. <laughs> okay.
In a moment, the, uh, the young people are going to be going out, but we're going to sing a song. When I realised it was Bible Sunday, I thought we haven't done this song for ages. And it's all about the Bible. So we're going to sing Giants of Faith. If you're able, let's. Well, in a moment, we'll um, listen to God's word. But before we do that, 
As I was sitting down there listening to Tim earlier on, I realised I'd forgotten something that's down there. So we're going to light our candle for, for the Ukraine. And then say a prayer for them. So let's pray. Father, as we think of the ongoing situation in Ukraine, we pray for the people, for the leaders, for those that are trying to bring this conflict to an end, people around the world. We pray particularly today for the current situation with um, power stations being attacked and there being no electricity in parts of the country. So we pray that solutions will be found to that, particularly for those things where power is needed, hospitals and the like. So Lord, it's an ongoing situation that we feel we, we can't see how an end will come, but you know the answer to that. And so we ask for your guidance and your blessing on the people that will bring that conflict to an end. Amen. I'm afraid I don't know who's doing the readings this morning, so we will now have our two readings. Thank you, Barbara. The first reading today is from Romans chapter 15. We who are strong ought to bear with the feelings of the, the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbours for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. And the second reading is from Luke chapter 18, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. And now I'd like to uh, invite Maggie up to bring us God's word. Good morning. Um, after such a long time away, it's really good that we're able to be here with you again 
um, this morning. I think once during one of the lockdown times, we did actually appear on Zoom um, and uh, were able to share the service with you in that way. But of course, that's no substitute for being here in person. So before we turn to this passage, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. Thank you that you have given us your word to guide us, that we can learn from it and learn better how to follow you. And I pray now that you would give us ears to hear, Lord, what you have to say to each one of us. Amen. Okay, so can we have the slide? Okay, thank you. Oh, let's see if it was go. Oh, was that the first one? Okay, I thought it was another one. Never mind. Yes, okay, right, that's fine. That's <laughs> I was just going to share that before I started talking. Sorry. That's all right. Can I blank it? No, never mind. Um, yeah, so um, as Nick said, this, uh, the passage that we've just had in, heard in Romans, um, there was the verse, verse 4 was the one that was particularly highlighted for this Sunday, being Bible Sunday. But of course, we never want to look at just one verse in the Bible and just focus on that out of context. So we're going to look at the whole of the, the reading that we had, the six verses, and also there's a very strong link with them, with the reading that we heard from Luke as well. So we're going to look at both those together, um, as, as well as particularly looking at this verse 4. So first of all, I think that these verses challenge us about our attitude to our fellow Christians. In the church at Rome, there were Christians from a Jewish background and also those um, from a Gentile or a non-Jewish background. Many of the ones from a Jewish background condemned the, the non-Jews, non-Jewish background Christians, because they didn't follow all the laws, all the Jewish laws. Um, and their attitude was, you're not, you're not proper Christian if you don't follow these rules. Now, Paul calls these people, the Jewish ones, the ones who believe the Jewish rules were still important, weak. And he calls them weak, I think, because they had a weaker knowledge and understanding of God's grace. They hadn't really grasped that God's grace is not dependent on rules. God's grace is free for all of us and is not because of our works, but is a free gift from God through Jesus. Now, the others, the Gentiles, ones from a non-Jewish background, Paul calls them strong, strong because they had that better understanding of God's grace. But he also condemns their attitude because they despised the ones who thought they still had to follow the rules because they said they were still in bondage to them and they looked down on them for that. And we see this wrong attitude also in the reading from Luke where the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. It's very clear that the Pharisee had that superior attitude. I know much better than you. Similar to the, to the attitude of the, uh, the ones from a non-Jewish background who thought that they'd understood things better and look down on their fellow Christians. And we see in this reading in Romans that we're called to put others' sensitivities before our own pleasure or comfort. And that reminds us of how Jesus told us to love our neighbor as ourselves, not to look down on our neighbor. And we're told to act in a way that would build up each other's faith. In the NIV, we read in verse 2 that it said, each of us should please our neighbors. Now, we might look at that and think, oh, but elsewhere we're told we're supposed to please God, not please other people. But it's important to read this in the context of the rest of the sentence. Please our neighbors for their good to build them up. And in fact, the New Living Translation has translated that as, we should help, each other, we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. So it's about, it's not about pleasing people to keep them happy, 
um, and just thinking it doesn't matter what they do. It's about helping others in our congregation, our brothers and sisters, to do what is right, to please God, and so that we build up the whole congregation in Christ. And Paul goes on to give the example of Jesus. And of course, Jesus gives us the ultimate example of someone who didn't put his own pleasure first. Jesus gave up everything to die for us, for our sake. He was willing to obey God, whatever the cost. And he talks about having the same attitude. Just trying to find the, the verse. Yes, in verse 5, that we may have the same attitude. And that reminded me, of course, of Philippians um, chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, when Paul there explains what the attitude of, Christ Je of Jesus is. He says, you must have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. So when we have the same attitude as Christ, we don't insist on our own right. We're willing to serve others. So we don't insist on the freedom that we have. In Paul's case, we see that he didn't insist in the previous chapter on being able to eat the meat that had been sacrificed to idols. In his mind, he knew there was nothing wrong with eating that meat. But if that caused a problem for other people, for fellow brothers, fellow Christians, brothers and sisters, then he was ready to, ready to give up that right and say, well, I won't eat it then. This passage, too, talk, teaches us about our unity through Christ and reminds us that what unites us is our faith in Christ as the one through whom God has saved us. That needs to be the centre of our faith and the reason for our unity. And we need to concentrate on Christ as the centre of our faith rather than minor issues. Of course, that's easy to say. What I think is a minor issue, you might think is a major issue, and vice versa. But I think the main point here is that we, it's not up to us to judge other people. That's God's job, to judge other people. What we need to concentrate on is that all those who God has chosen, all those who God has accepted, then we need to do the same. We don't have to agree with them on everything, but we need to accept them. And I think it's interesting that in chapter 14, as I mentioned a minute ago, Paul, he doesn't, he doesn't tell us to tell the weak to go against their consciences. It's not up to us. It wasn't up to Paul to say to those who didn't want to eat the meat sacrificed to idols that they should just go ahead with it anyway. If they believed it was wrong, they shouldn't do it. So if I believe something is incompatible with my faith, then I shouldn't do it, even if for you that's okay. And I shouldn't be trying to encourage others to do that to either. I think it's important too that in verse 5 and verse, well, verse 6, we read about, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that reminds us that it's as we are together and as we worship God, that is a sign of our unity. We express our unity as we worship together, we worship the one God. And of course, it's a reminder too of what Jesus prayed in, in John chapter 17. He prays for unity amongst his disciples. And he says that is how the world will know that the Father sent him. So it's as we accept each other and as we join together in unity that others will see who God is and that will bring glory to him.
So what does that mean for us? For me, as, I've, as we've been involved in, in cross-cultural work, as we've been interacting with Christians from a huge variety of denominations and cultural backgrounds, I found this a challenge. Some, some of the issues that we came across are where people felt there was one right attitude to have towards an issue with things like whether you drink alcohol or not, whether you should homeschool your children, whether adult baptism is the only real baptism, how you should act on the Sabbath, should you fast, is that essential? What are the roles of men and women? Is it okay to own a gun? Is it okay to dance? And I realize I find it very easy to fall into that attitude of superiority to be thinking, well, how can they possibly think that Christians shouldn't do that? That's ridiculous. They obviously don't understand the Bible very well. Or alternatively, how can a Christian possibly think that is okay? Where, what are they missing? It's so easy to fall into that attitude. And I think part of that is that sometimes to be secure in our own beliefs on things we have to believe it's the only right, the only possible belief. As soon as we think, we sometimes have the feeling that if we accept that someone else might actually be right, then maybe I'm wrong, and I want to be secure in my own belief. But Paul didn't have that uncertainty. He was able to, to hold to his belief that it was fine not to hold the Jewish keep to the Jewish laws elsewhere we see that he was very strong in saying the non-Jewish believers didn't need to be circumcised didn't need to follow all the rules so that he didn't waver on that but yet he still accepted those who didn't agree with him and who felt it was right he accepted everyone on their basis of their faith in Jesus so we too shouldn't be insisting that others follow our rules, follow our understanding of what is correct Christian behavior. And I think these three questions are important ones that we, we ask ourselves. Do I condemn others for not following the same rules as I do? Do I say, well, they can't possibly be a Christian if they don't do this? Do I despise others for following rules that I think are important? Why are they bothering with that? Jesus has set us free from that. And then am I willing to give up my own pleasures for the sake of other believers? Am I willing to not have a beer when I'd like one because that might offend the people I'm with? Just as Paul was ready not to eat the meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And I think Paul also is showing us that those who are strong have a responsibility to support the right of others to hold different views. If we are mature, then we should be supporting the right of others to hold different views, rather than expecting everyone to be like us. So we then come specifically to this verse 4. <coughs> it seems when reading it that often um, that actually this verse was a bit of a, an aside um, that as Paul was, his main point in this chapter and the, and the chapter before is about different rules and the weak and the strong. But he just has this little aside. But that doesn't mean it's not important. I think there are many things that we can learn about the scriptures just from this one verse. The first thing is something that Nick already mentioned. Paul says, everything was written to teach us. Now he's, he's talking about something that was written centuries previously to when he's talking, never mind to when we are. But yet he says it was written to teach us. And just as that was, Paul recognized that the Old Testament was also written to teach people around in the first century. Equally, as Nick said, it's also there to teach us today. And that reminded me of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where we read, the word of God is alive and active. It's also clear from here that the Old Testament 
reveals Christ. Here in, in, verse, in this passage, but also in many passages that Paul has written, and also Jesus himself, it's very clear that the Old Testament was, for, was foretelling Jesus. And again, as, as we've already heard, God's word, in God's word we see his faithfulness and we can find encouragement and hope. We learn to endure suffering and difficulties because of the promises, because of the hope that we have of fu the future. And that encourages us to persevere. And I'm sure many of us have particular verses or passages that we hold on to when things are hard. Some of the verses that I find helpful in those situations are from Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then Matthew 28. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Although we have to remember that follows a command of Jesus to proclaim him in all that we do. And then also Psalm 139 which I found particularly helpful when I was when in living in, in different countries. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. So God's word can encourage us, can give us hope. And it's, it's interesting that in verse 4, he's, he's talked about how the scriptures give us hope and encouragement. And then verse 5, he immediately goes on to say, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement. So it's very clear that it's actually that God is the source of the endurance and encouragement. Yes, it comes through his word, but God is the source because it is his word. So our encouragement, our endurance comes from God through his word. So we need the scriptures. Those of us here today, but also Christians all over the world. And you saw at the beginning of Tim's talk, the many millions of people who don't have access to God's word in a, in a language that they really understand. And so that's why we, together with local Christians, in Cote d'Ivoire and Ivory Coast, as you, you saw on, the, um, on Tim's talk, Christians all over, French-speaking Africa. That's why together we're working to ensure that Christians do have access to God's word in languages and also in formats. We heard about the audio recording as well that are appropriate to them so that God can speak to them so that they can gain that hope and encouragement just like them, just like us. And of course, it's not just Christians who need God's word. We believe that God can speak through his word to people who don't yet know him. And we want everyone to have the opportunity to hear from God and to come to know God and to have a relationship with him. Amen.
Let us pray. Let us first of all give thanks for our ease of access to the Bible. Father, we thank you that it is so easy in this country for us to have access to numerous versions of your word. Help us never to take it for granted. And we thank, give thanks for the work of Wycliffe making God's word accessible to pe in people's native languages. Father, it is so difficult to understand your word if you're having to read it or listen to it in a language that is not your first language. We thank you for the work of all those in Wycliffe and other organizations that seek to make it possible for people everywhere to be able to understand, to hear, and to read your word. And we pray for all those people who work to bring God's word to others. 
to the translators and to the many other people that work with them to make it possible. We pray for those who are just beginning to receive God's word in their own language for the first time. May it really open up to them the depth of love that God has for them. We pray for the many people who have yet to receive God's word, whether that is because it is not in a language they understand or whether because it they live in countries where it is difficult to reach them. We pray in the same way for persecuted Christians for whom it is often very dangerous for them to be known to be a Christian, very dangerous to have your word. Father, we pray that you will keep them safe, that you encourage them, and that the small times that they are able to get together the times when they are able to read your word without fear of being caught by the authorities and imprisoned or worse, we pray that they will value those times and that you will speak to their hearts no matter what their circumstances are. We pray for governments everywhere that their decisions might be made in line with the law of God, whether they know you or not, Father. We pray that their decisions will be those made for the good of their people rather than for their own power. We pray for the people who are reading or listening to God's word for the first time. May it speak deeply into their lives. We pray for ourselves that we might read and listen to God's word without taking it for granted, without allowing it to be so familiar that we don't truly hear what you are saying, Lord. And finally, we pray for those who are suffering in body, mind or spirit, that they might find comfort in, and strength in what the Lord speaks to them, and may we bring the truth of God's love for them in the way we reach out to all those in need. These and all our prayers we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we're now going to bring those prayers together in the words that Jesus taught us. As our Saviour taught us, so in faith and trust we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we're going to finish our service now with our final hymn, Speak, O Lord.
Well, thank you again to Tim and Maggie for coming all the way down from Suffolk to see us. And um, we really do continue to pray for everything that you're doing and the, and the great work of um, Wycliffe Bible Translators. So let's finish today by saying the grace to each other. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you. Have a lovely week, everybody.